It's Wednesday, April 17, 2024. Exciting game last night. Arkansas beats Texas Tech 9-8. to We'll talk about it today on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Plus, we'll look back at last week's series against Alabama and ahead to this week's series in South Carolina. But first, a word from our sponsor. Kendall King, where it's all about teamwork. Building brands around a design concept, Kendall King takes pride in their skill sets and displays and signing, as well as dot-com photography, content creation, and influencer marketing. The bases are loaded, and the Kendall King team is bringing it home. This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, presented by Kendall King, the first podcast devoted entirely to Arkansas baseball, featuring insight from Arkansas baseball color analyst Bubba Carpenter. Here's your host, Matt Jones. And welcome into our downtown Fayetteville studio for the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Hope you slept well. Uh, We did not. Uh, Late night last night. At Baumwalker Stadium, Nolan Souza with a sack fly at 10.41 p.m. to end a, a, an incredible game, Bubba, a game that I don't think halfway through it we thought was going to maybe end the way that it, it did. Arkansas down 7 to nothing. They beat Texas Tech 9-8 to eight on Souza's sack fly in the ninth. It's the largest comeback that Arkansas has had to win a game since 2017 against Louisiana Tech. They played a game down there in the non-conference in, in 17 and we're down 10 to 1, came back and won that one 13 to 10, a seven run deficit. You just don't see that get covered very often in, in, in any level, but, but uh, you know, especially not an SEC or a, a quality team. Texas Tech, not an SEC team, but a, a real quality program. Right. I tell you what, it was, it was huge for this team, though, Matt. I mean, coming off of a series loss in Alabama and then, you know, going into last night, I mean, you know, the way the game started, I mean, poor Ben, ben Bybee, everything he threw up there got hit hard. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but credit this team. They're down 7 nothing. They don't panic at all. And I talked to Nolan Susan after the game about it. And, you know, I've talked to multiple guys about it. And even DVH refers to it all the time. They're calm in the dugout. They're confident. They just feel like they're going to come back and win the game. And, you know, I jokingly say on the air all the time, yeah, we got them right. We want them. But <laughs> it seemed like last night everything was kind of going the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. You know, all the breaks were going. Everything they hit was finding a hole. We were hitting balls hard on – Right at him, um, you know, you got the one hopper to to um, Peyton Stovall at second. He makes that play 99 times out of 100. You know, the sinking line drive to Edmondson, right? There were, like, so many things that just went, didn't go our way early in the game. And then all of a sudden, you know, they find a way to turn it around. It's – when you think about the way Arkansas had hit in Alabama, did not hit well last weekend really at all, maybe outside the first inning of, of game one, and then you're playing a team, Texas Tech, who's seventh nationally in batting average, uh, or seventh in, in sc- run scoring. They're eighth in batting average. I mean, this is an elite hitting Texas Tech team. And you're sitting there wondering, are you going to get run rolled on your home field at, at one point last night? I mean, I, I think that was a thought that probably crossed a lot of people's mind. Yeah, I think so. And, and the thing is, is, look, Ben wasn't bad last night. Ben was actually making pretty good pitches. I mean, he was throwing – change-ups down and away, and they were they were squaring them up 101 miles an hour. You know, he would throw a good slider down, and they'd stay on it. The 0-2 home run he gave up, you know, I want to say the guy fouled off two or three pitches. It was like the sixth pitch with an 0-2 count. That's a slider down and away off the plate. The dude's just – I think McGee was his name. He's just leaning out over the plate, hooks it to left field, gets mm-hmm. it up in the wind, hits it 91 miles an hour, but the wind carried it out into the hog pen. And, you know, you're looking, and it's like, wow – but he really didn't look bad. Now, he wasn't as sharp as he's been, but it's not like he was throwing balls right over the middle of the plate. They were – credit their hitters. They were they were just on him. I'm a big believer in that good teams respond. Mm-hmm. And there were two responses within last night's game. There was the response to the 7 nothing deficit, Texas Tech, and then even the solo home run that they hit in the seventh to go back up 8-7. to seven. I think it would be easy to have exerted all your energy on this comeback and then – an inning and a half later, yeah. they hit a home run, and, and it just pops the balloon. So there's the response within the game on a couple of different occasions. But then there's also the response from Alabama and not playing well at Alabama the last couple of games, offensively especially. Uh, and, and I don't know, it's, 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 I think that's what championship teams do is, is they find a way to respond to you know, when things aren't going well for them. And I, and I thought that was a big uh, – it, it, maybe it showed me something about Arkansas last night. No, I, th- I agree. I think I think it was huge. Okay, so let's say we lose that game. You know, we, we're a three-game losing streak. You never know where things can go from there. And yeah. then we still got to go out and play them again tonight. And they are a good hitting team. Um, 
anything can happen. He could start a tailspin, and you, you just you, know, you don't want to see that. But I think the fact that they battled back, I mean, it was a long game. I, I don't know. I feel really good about going to the ballpark today. But I just think uh, I think it showed a lot about the team, the fight in this team. Uh, they don't give up. And then when they had to, they made a big play. When they needed that big hit, they got the big hit. And then more importantly, we took advantage of a couple of mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, you got the third baseman. That's a tough play. Ball made a bad hop on it. But then the pitcher – comebacker you know we saw that last week in Alabama you know the guy just the game just sped up on him and he kind of panicked and didn't know what to do mm -hmm. should have been a routine double play really and as a result you know it's an error and he doesn't get a single out but the, the thing about this team I'll tell you Phil pointed out something last night on the broadcast that's incredible to me at home Texas Tech hits 364 on the road they hit 267 the wind doesn't blow out 50 miles an hour <laughs> on the road but I have never seen a split that big. Yeah. That's incredible. Now, I've seen splits where, I mean, Razorbacks hit better at home. Mm -hmm. Most teams hit better at their home ballpark. It's just we're creatures of habit. But to see a split that big is something I don't know that I've ever seen one like that. You know, I was talking to, uh, I think it was Joe Healy from D1 Baseball, several, maybe even back in the, or maybe it was, it was somebody over at D1. It was either Joe Healy or Aaron Fitt. But they made a point. They said, you know, Mason Molina, his stats at Texas Tech, Imagine if he played his home games in a different ballpark. Oh, yeah. Because it's such an offensive driven park. I mean, you got the wind that, that blows out there at all times of the day. Uh, and, and so it, it does inflate. I mean, look at Hudson White this year. Now, he's facing better pitching in the SEC than he saw in the Big 12, but his offensive numbers aren't anywhere near what he was doing at Texas Tech last season. So I think there's something about their ballpark that, you know, is, is really a, a true home field advantage for them from an offensive perspective. Well, what's even more incredible, think of Mason Molina. He's a fly ball pitcher. He yeah, throws a, uh, a high carry fastball at the top of the zone. You make a mistake with that, just one inch, and that's the difference in a pop up. Actually, not even an inch, an eighth of an inch mm -hmm. difference in a pop up and a home run when you're playing in a, in windy conditions like that. So I think what Molina was able to do last year is incredible. Yeah, was, wind was blowing about 25 miles an hour last night. I had this thought, you know, Texas Tech players, hey, a nice breeze. Yeah, coming through the ballpark. <laughs> I said it. I said, you know what? I think they feel right at home with yeah. that, that wind blowing in yeah. like that. Of course, it was blowing in. It usually blows out where mm -hmm. they play. But uh, but I, I don't know. You, you look at some of the balls hit last night. You look at uh, uh, Jason Jones. He hit that ball 111 to center field. Mm -hmm. Any other day, that's that's a home run. Souza may have hit a grand slam oh. any other day on, on the sack. Yeah. I mean, when it came off the bat, I immediately – I think I said, hey, that may be a grand slam. So, and then yeah. wind knocked it down. But As soon as he hit it, I'm like – I'm like, he's got yeah. it. Yeah. Because, you know, I saw it go up, and then I glanced at track, man, it's 99 off the bat at that trajectory, and, boy, it just went up there and died. But you're right, any mm -hmm. other day, that probably hit DVH's office. There were two you – you and I were walking out of the stadium last night, I don't know, midnight, somewhere in there, and we were talking about two plays that really stood out to us. Um, one that stood out to me, second inning, Texas Tech scored six runs. But they could have scored a seventh if not for Jared Spraglot going yeah. home uh, for a force out on a, a little low hopper to him at third base. And then in the ninth inning, after Wilmsmeyer had come in as a, a pinch runner in the eighth, he's in center field as a defensive replacement in the ninth, and he runs down a ball that, that Peyton Holt, no offense to Peyton Holt, who I love, and we're going to talk about him here in just a minute, but he's not making that play in center field. Right. That's probably an RBI double that gives Texas Tech a lead if Wilmsmeyer isn't in the ninth inning in center field. Yeah, you're right. No, I don't think very many SEC outfielders catch that ball. And he made it look easy. I mean, from the start, as soon as it was hit, I thought that's a double in the gap for sure. Uh, the Jared Sprague lot play in the second inning, you're right. It's it's crazy, but, you know, one play can change a game. And, you know, we talked about it on the way out last night, how when you're a third baseman, I teach my third baseman, you have to – everything's predetermined. Mm -hmm. It's like the base running mistake Jared Sprague lot <clears throat> made at Alabama with two outs. Mm -hmm. you got to score on that ball. Yeah. Base hit to left, you got to score. It's predetermined. You're When that ball's hit, you're going. you got a two-out lead, you're going on, you're going on contact. Um, when you're playing third base right there without getting to all the, the details of it, but there's so many things you got to know in that situation. If a ball takes me to my left, I'm going to second. If a ball takes me to my right, I'm going to touch the bag and throw across the infield. If it's a high chopper, I got to catch it and throw it at first. That's my only out. If a ball takes me in, which that one did, I mm -hmm. go home. And there's so many things, and it's so it's split second. And he he came and got it. It was, wasn't hit hard, 70, 60-something miles an hour mm -hmm. off the bat. But he came and got fielded it and made a perfect throw home. And uh, 
You're right. That's a huge play in the game. Because there's got to be a temptation there for him that there's one out, hey, I can turn and make a double play here. But with the way his momentum was taking him toward the plate, if he turns around and tries to throw to second base, that ball could very easily end up in right field. Yep, it'll end up in right field because that ball's going to sail on you. It's just a tough play. Can't remember who was running. Oh, the DH was running. Um, I think the DH hit the ball, but he runs. He runs okay. Um, I want to say it was him, but anyway, at any any rate, the the best bet is to take your out at the plate right there, mm-hmm. and uh, he made the right choice. DH was a uh, Bazell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, that's the play right there. By the way, we thought it was Basil, like David Basil and, uh, and yeah. Bazell. <laughs> they came in. They came in the booth to make sure we got the pronunciation Dif- different, right. <laughs> different way of pronouncing. So Arkansas and Texas Tech play this afternoon. Four o'clock is going to be the first pitch over at Ball Walker Stadium. Ought to be a beautiful day for baseball. The uh, I think the high temperature day is supposed to be about 85 degrees. It's it's going to feel like real baseball weather when they play. Arkansas is going to throw Colin Fisher this afternoon. He's been great, left-handed freshman out of Oklahoma. Uh, you just kind of know what you're going to get with Colin Fisher. It's just consistent. It may be three innings, maybe four, maybe five, but it doesn't walk a lot of batters. It doesn't give up a whole lot of hits. I think he's got about a 1.09 whip going into this game. Uh, and then uh, Texas Tech's going to throw a right-hander today. Let me pull up his name right here. Hudson Parker. And we were looking up his stats a little bit earlier, and and it's kind of like Texas Tech's bullpen across the board. It's 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 not terrible, but it's not real impressive either. The numbers, and and he's got a whip over two, which is something that really stands out to me. Well, I think I what did I say? He's got six innings. He's hit like nine batters, mm-hmm. or he's walked nine batters, hit four. I want to say a lot of free um, passes. You know, I think lefties are hitting 200 against him. Righties are hitting over 300. So, you know, that says he's probably got a pretty good changeup. Most guys that are, in, you know, with those splits, that means he's got a pretty good changeup he can throw to lefties. But, uh, yeah, but the problem is for him is getting it across the plate. That's that's not really good. Uh, that's that's you, There's effectively wild, and then there's wild. And I think this guy looks, just stat sheet-wise, looks wild. Before we move to Alabama, uh, I was looking at something yesterday. You played against Tim Tadlock in college. Yeah. What do you remember about him? He was a shortstop at Tech. Yeah, okay. So I talked to him yesterday, and um, I talk to him every year when he comes in, and he always tells me the same story. He's like, he's like, hey, I remember you. He said, I shifted on you before a shift was a shift. <laughs> and uh, he said he used to slide over deep mm-hmm. uh, when I would come up. And uh, he said he was just telling some of his coaches about George Cole Field. Mm-hmm. He said right before I came over and started talking to him. So he's a – He's a good guy. Known him for a long time. I really like him. Classy guy. Um, I think he does a good job with the team. Does a good job recruiting. And uh, he's always got hitters, which I like. I like a team that knows how to hit and has a good approach. But I really enjoy talking to him. He is a character. He is. And he, you know, he's an old school guy. And I feel like that old school mentality is starting. There's fewer and fewer. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're dying breed. <laughs> I went back and found something yesterday uh, when Arkansas played Tech in 19 at the College World Series. I actually interviewed Tadlock and Dave Van Horn about they started as junior college coaches mm-hmm. in Texas around the same time. Now, they never their teams never played against each other, but they would cross paths on the recruiting trail. Uh, it's just a great story. I mean, you know, Van Horn would talk about you buy your own mower and you, you cut the yeah. grass. And Tadlock said <laughs> that he raised his kids for a while in one of the dorms on the campus of the junior college until his wife said, we've had enough of this, we're moving. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's a great story that I tweeted out yesterday. Just, uh, it really, it's interesting to look at the backgrounds of these coaches, yeah. and it, I think it probably gives you some insight into how much they appreciate what they have now because of the jobs where they came from. That's what people don't get. It's, uh, they're not just given these jobs. These jobs were earned. I mean, look at mm-hmm. DVH. Look what I mean. Look at look at all of his stops and and you know Karen and the family. Having to, you know the, uh, everywhere they went with him. I think uh, I think it's awesome. And then Tim Tadlock's another one. You can look at multiple coaches right now that are successful in in high level programs, and you look at their where they came from. You know, and I think it's. I look at today. You know, everybody wants. Oh, I want. You know. I want to start here. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah. You start down here and you work your way up. And, you know, that's why those guys are so good at what they do. They started at the ground floor, and so they know what it's like to be at every level. And I think that makes them better once they get to the level they're at. There's a drive there. In, oh, in yeah. that story that I wrote, you know, Rob Childress is also part of this because he was Van Horn's assistant coach in Texarkana. They talk about 
uh, Dave and Karen Van Horn took him to the Catfish King restaurant for his interview to be a, an assistant coach at Texarkana <laughs> College, and, and, and probably they were able to pay him next to nothing. Uh, but there's there's a it's interesting just to see the backgrounds of all these different coaches uh, who get into these prominent jobs. Let's look back at Alabama. Arkansas loses the series two to one. It's their first series loss of the year. They win Friday night, dominant outing by Hagen Smith. Pitching was not bad during, especially not starting pitching. Uh, during the series against Alabama, Mason Molina had a pretty good outing. Brady Tigert had a pretty good outing, and we'll we'll talk about their outings a little bit later. But they just don't get the big hit in Game Two, and I thought that was really the key to the series, Game Three notwithstanding. They just couldn't get that big hit, you know, consistently enough in Game Two. They lose that one four to three in extra innings when Jake Faraday has a, a throwing error, and then on Sunday it seems like there's always one game a year where there's a left-hander who you look at his numbers yeah. and you say. You ought to get, you know, you ought to do damage against this guy. And then he just shuts you down. I think about Louisiana Tech in 2021. They had a lefty, I believe, on on the Sunday game that year and just shut Arkansas down. I think it was like a two-hit shutout or something. It just seems like there's always that one game a year where a left-hander comes yeah. out of nowhere to to really shove. You're right. And, you know, you look at – when. so when I saw the pitching matchup, we're playing a tournament this past weekend, so – you know, I'm I'm following you and I'm I'm listening to Phil and, and as soon as I saw the pitcher was announced, Zane Adams, I'm I go and I look at his numbers. I'm like, yes, we got the series. Well, it's like an, it's like a, <laughs> a whip close to two, an ERA <laughs> over eight. I mean, you know? I mean, there's certain things I look a at freshman? when I go in and I look and there's little telltale signs that wow, it's gonna be a good day to be a Razorback hitter. And I looked at him, I'm like, yeah, we got we got this. And then I'm listening to the game, and I'm like, okay, yeah, we're going to get on. Now we've seen him once, now we'll get on him, okay. Now we've seen him twice, oh, this is our time. <laughs> and it just never materialized. Oh. And he really, nothing special other than he pitched, Matt. He just pitched. He got ahead and was able to land some secondary pitches. He didn't pattern um, – I don't know, he just pitched, I guess, and that's the best way to describe it. And if you're a lefty that, that works ahead and, and throws a few good pitches, you can, you can do what he did. One of the keys, I thought, in that game was that Arkansas, they had six first pitch outs. Yeah. Didn't drive his pitch count up at all, and that was a problem early last night against Texas Tech, too. Yeah. Their left-hander who started, I think he was at 33 pitches through three innings. That's been the key to Arkansas offensively, and, I mean, you can say what you want about their offense. It, it's struggling, obviously, this year. Um, last night, I think, toward the end of the game, showed that there is a lot of potential there in, in the lineup. But when they have been successful this year, it's been because they're driving the pitch count up. They're taking walks. You know, they're forcing a guy to, to hit batters. Uh, they weren't doing that against Alabama. And, and I don't know, it's, it's almost like they got outside of their approach a little bit, and, and then they never really could find it mid-game. I think you're right. We've done such a great job of starting pitching, getting their pitch count up, working counts. Now, I don't know what the I don't know what their approach was. I didn't I didn't talk to um, Nate about it yesterday. I usually li I like I really like to talk to Nate, like especially when we're at home. I'm like, you know, what'd you see on this guy? What kind of what are y'all thinking going in? Mm -hmm. and, and and Nate's awesome. Nate Thompson will give me a really good insight, you know, into kind of what the approach is going in. I don't know what their approach was against this guy, and and usually I can watch the game and kind of say, okay, this is what we're trying to do. Honestly, I couldn't figure it out, and I'm not knocking the guys or anything. I couldn't figure out what what we were trying to do against them. We were swinging at some breaking balls early. We were swinging at, at, at I, I don't know. I just we were. It's what I call being caught in between. I talk about it all the time. We were early on off speed, but then we were late on fastballs, and so couldn't figure out what we were really trying to do with him. But you're right. We made too many outs early in the count, and that allowed him to go longer. I think if we get him out of there. Which who would have ever thought he'd have gone eight innings against us? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think they were expecting three or four, maybe. And but you know, that's life, and that's life on the road in the SEC. You just never know when you're going to run up against that one guy that's having a good day. It's in here to adjust my hat. I just realized I was wearing it like Gomer Pyle at the start of the show. Yeah, you are kind of. <laughs> you, you got a little Gomer in you. I didn't want to say anything, but <laughs> I mean, you still look good though. It, it's the uh, it's it's the Bob Jones look. My grandpa, he, he would wear his like that. When you uh, when you lose a series, I feel like it gets your attention way more than if you're winning and you're not yeah. looking good. You know, it's like they've had. I mean, they've had some series this year. What was it? Uh, Ole Miss with Ole Miss. I don't know. One of the, one of these series they've had recently, we talked about it. Every every game could have gone the other way. Right. Auburn, maybe that was the, game, the series I'm thinking about. 
but it, you know, you win a couple of one run games and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. It, it, I feel like it gets your attention more when you lose than it does when you're winning because then all of a sudden it's like, hey, this is all the stuff we've been talking to you about, but now it's it's starting to affect you on the field. Yeah. Well, and you look at some of the plays we didn't make against Alabama and plays that we typically make. You know, I mean, there were a few not routine plays, but just plays that I feel like that 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 we typically make as a as a Razorback team. And I think it, it came back, you know, some of them they don't go as errors, but they're plays that that we typically make. And I think uh, you know, some of the at bats, you go back and look at some of the at bats, they weren't quality at bats and I think those start to add up over the course of a game but you're right I think it can be a good awakening and I think last night was I honestly think coming out last night and getting punched like that early in the game mm -hmm. I think is really good for our guys now I hate for, I hate it for Ben Bybee because I love Ben Bybee I do I love talking to that guy and he's uh, been so good for he's him. been so good I felt for him because like I said I think it was just a really good approach against him um but he just – he didn't have an answer. He mm -hmm. couldn't stop it, and they just kept hitting the ball. And when the, even the ones they didn't hit hard found a hole. You know, he made a couple of good change-ups. They hit off the end of the bat. Um, so, I don't know. It's um, – you know, I, I think it's good, though. I really do. I think uh, I think, I think think it can be a wake-up call. But I think I think the first inning last night, first and second inning – or second inning was a, a wake-up call for us. I think that's good to get smacked around a little bit. See how you respond. And that can happen to good pitchers. As, as that was happening last night, I, I kept having these flashbacks to what TCU was doing to Hagen Smith in the regional last year. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. sometimes when they've got your number, they got your number, and, right. and there's just nothing you can do about it. How do you fix Arkansas's offensive struggles right now? Uh, and, and I want to preface that with Rob Vaughn, the Alabama coach, he was so complimentary of Arkansas defensively and talked about that defense takes away so many runs during the course of a game. And that's something you can't really you you can't really gauge how many runs are taken away during the course of a game. You look at a, a guy like Ty Wilmsmeyer, not hitting the ball well, but what does he do in center field that saves runs for? I mean, we talked about the run that he saved against Texas Tech last night, and so it's this it's this balance. I, I feel like you got to they've got one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in the SEC, right. They're fielding nine eighty one overall. It's closer to nine ninety in SEC play. How do you balance? wanting to be really good defensively with knowing that you need to have more production at the plate? Well, it's it's tough. And and I want to go back and say some of the errors that we have are kind of fluke errors. Yeah. I think Faraday's a fluke thing. I think there's been a couple of those. I think uh, Jared Spray Glide had a couple of tough errors early on at Globe Life Field. Mm -hmm. He got one but, last night, too, that I did not feel like I, was his error. It that, was Ben McLaughlin. Yeah, that wasn't his error. That ball wasn't in the dirt. Now, it's a tough, tough play. Ben's going to catch that every yeah. time. Um, so, yeah. But um, as far as balancing it out, you know, I, I always talk about money ball. You want to know, okay, so – how does this guy benefit me more? Is he going to save me more runs in on defense, mm -hmm. or am I better off sacrificing maybe that one ball in the gap that this other guy is going to catch for three or four more hits? And that's that's kind of the tough balance that mm -hmm. you kind of deal with. And honestly, looking at the lineup last night, I've said it all year. You've heard me talk about it. I'm in the Peyton Holt fan club. There's a lot of talent on that team, but I loved seeing Peyton Holt in the leadoff spot. Now, will it carry over to the weekend? I don't know, Matt, but now he's not a prototypical leadoff guy because I, Phil said something last night. He swung it like seven first pitches in a row going back to the Alabama game, mm. and he swung it three first pitches last night. Mm -hmm. But he gets a good pitch and puts a good swing on it. And if it's not a good pitch, he doesn't swing. He doesn't chase a lot early in the count. I think you just need – it's it's that, that balance to where hitting is contagious, but so is not hitting. And, I, I, I mean, I know I'm a glass-half-full guy, this team is gonna score runs. All right, I'm a glass three quarters full. All right, um, um, and I do have razor. You were goggles. happy we didn't come in here with a three game losing streak <laughs> to talk about today. Uh, you, you, what was the first thing you and I talked about last night leaving the stadium? <laughs> Thank right? God yeah. they won. That we've got something <laughs> positive to talk about. Yeah, you know, but but you know, you, you can baseball is a funny game. You can you can mm -hmm. sit there and watch a game like I I could watch. Um, let's pick out game three of the of Razorback series Sunday against Alabama, and then you can you can pick out all the positives or you can pick out all the negatives. There mm -hmm. were a bunch of negatives you could pick out. There really were. Um, at bats, defense, and all that, or you can look at all the positives. And I, I tell you what, when Peyton Holt made that that play in the first inning Sunday mm -hmm. against a great catch against the wall, doubles the guy off first, once again, I'm like, yes, 
there we go. We forgot about the day before. That's a tough loss. Mm -hmm. Saturday was a tough loss. That's a tough way to lose. I'd rather the guy have just hit a bomb and walked it off um, than to lose the way we did. But once Peyton made that play, I'm like, all right, we forgot about that. The momentum's our way. We're going to win this game. And it, like I said, it just didn't happen. Even within that game two loss against Alabama, I was impressed with the way they responded. I mean, you had the home run by Holt, number one, in the ninth inning uh, that ties the game with two outs. You have the catch by Kendall Diggs, which may be the best defensive play of the year. Yeah. On the warning track, just lays out, knows he has to give up his body. And he's hurting, and we're going to talk about that a little bit here in a minute. But, you know, makes a great play. Uh, even Aloy, the shortstop, the, the play he made it short to spin and turn and throw that ball to save the run at the end of the ninth, that was a big play. And then you lose on a fluke play. I mean, you, yeah. you give up a double to start the, the tenth. You, you, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Holt, that guy's a gamer. Mm -hmm. I love him. I love watching him play, yeah. the enthusiasm that he has. You know, I love the fact that I know if he's going for a double, the helmet's going to fly off halfway yeah. between first and second. He's just a fun guy to watch. And, you know, you talked about the play in left field. There was the home run. Uh, there just – I don't know. There's something about him that just seems to really ignite this team. We saw it at the end of last year. Yeah. And maybe we're seeing that a little bit again this year. I mean, he had a big hit during the big six-run inning against Tech last night that, that was, you know, key to that. Yeah, I, you know, here's what I like about Peyton Holt. So from from the booth, I can see down in the dugout, and you can tell you can tell body language. You can tell you know you can tell who the guys are that aren't happy that they're not playing. Mm -hmm. Peyton Holt, when he's not in the lineup, when someone scores, he is the first guy to congratulate him. When someone makes a good play on defense, he's the first guy at the top of the steps, whether he's in the lineup or not. And that's the guy. I want nine of those guys on my team. You give me nine of those guys, we're winning a whole lot of games, Matt. And he's just that guy. Um, but when he's in the game, it just the ball finds him, does mm -hmm. it not? It seems yeah. like wherever he's at, the ball finds him. And when he's in the game, he's always up at the plate in in the right situation. And I don't know if you noticed him last night when they were they were making their pitch and change or they were talking. He did you see him pacing uh, around the the on deck circle? Mm -hmm. He was pacing around. I mean, he looked like a caged animal. <laughs> I mean, and I would have bet anything that he was going to come up and go through, get, come through in that situation. Yeah. Unfortunately, the guy threw him a really good slider, and he chased it down out of the zone. I'll put, I'll take him in that situation every time, every time. I, I, he's going to succeed. Is there such a thing as a clutch gene? Because Holt, when you watch him in practice, he's not a bad practice player, but there's something about when the lights come on that he is a. He, he is a better game player, I think, than he is a practice player. And then obviously, I mean, we've seen it time and again, whether it be the two-out home run against Alabama or you know, maybe the RBI single last night on the first pitch after Texas Tech makes the pitching change. It just seems like, you know, once most games, there's going to be a play that, that Peyton makes that you're going to look back on and say, that was a really big play that was key to the game. Yeah, I think there is. There's a So some guys have the ability to slow the game down mm. and – and I, and I, part of being clutch is not getting too err in the moment. Like I say, he was like a caged animal. You know, he that Set was him in. wanting to get up to the plate. That's not him nervous. That's him wanting to be the man in that spot. And then while well, they're still out there, he walks up in the on deck circle or by the plate, and he's still just kind of pacing around. Mm -hmm. You could tell he was he wanted to be the man in that situation. There's and there's a lot to say to that. I mean, just. But when you step up there, then you slow it all down. The guy threw him a first pitch slider, and he laid off of it. And that told me right there the the emotions are under control. But yeah, there's something to there's something to be said about that. Some guys have a knack for that, and some guys don't. Some guys get in that situation. The game speeds up on them. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not gonna throw any names under anyone under the bus. We had a player like that last year come up in that same situation. They'll swing three sliders in the dirt and go back to the dugout, banging his bat on the ground. Mm. You know, um, you got to be able to slow the game down, and it, it starts right here. They talk about how mental the game of baseball is, but but yeah, I, th I think there's definitely there's that clutch gene. We call it. There's some guys that can go out for BP, like like Peyton Holt. He takes a pretty good BP. He didn't take a great BP. But when the game comes on, I mean, when the lights come on, you know, he gets it done. We call that guy the 5 o'clock cowboy that goes out at 5 <laughs> o'clock and just hit nukes all over the field. The game starts, can't hit anything. What's the noise <laughs> he makes when he gets in? Peyton? Yeah. Urgh. He's got that. He's got that. <laughs> urgh. He's got that. 
that little thing in him that just it's not on a stat sheet, but boy, you can see it. And I, I love it. We gotta put that in the dictionary. <laughs> All right, we're just getting started here on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. We got questions coming up here in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsor. At Kendall King, we're proud of <clears throat> over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are design. And welcome back to the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Usually, if you're watching us live, you see us uh, with a bobblehead here. I guess Bubba has run out of bobbleheads this week, but you have brought... <laughs> it, it looks kind of like the sword and the stone baseball version. Yeah, it's heavy. And I tell you what, it says on it, sometimes you just have to play hardball. And after last night's game, I thought this was appropriate because mm. that's what we had to play last night. We had to, you know, we've had a lot of games where the pitching has won it. Last night we had to slug. You know, we, we're trying to figure out the identity of this team. Are we a team that can go out and play pitching and defense or a team that's got to go out and bang the ball? Last night we had to go out and bang the ball to get the win. And uh, so I thought it was appropriate for today. My dad, my mom got it for me a long time ago, and it sets on, my, on one of my shelves. And so, yeah, I brought <laughs> it in. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. We got questions. Uh, we've asked for questions uh, this week from uh, our message board at wholehogsports.com. Also uh, put out a little all call this morning for questions from Twitter. Got a couple of those. And Blake Sutton, our producer, is going to give us, uh, going to read those to us. Go ahead, Blake. All right. First one is from Rick B. in Barling, Arkansas. Never heard of Barling. Uh, Barling, right by Fort Smith. Okay. Fort well, Smith that... Northside School District right there. Okay, cool. Uh, I was wondering where that was. <laughs> Can you please give us an update on Kendall Diggs? I think they talked about it on the broadcast, but I was at the game watching, did not hear the update. So Kendall Diggs has got a little bit of a shoulder injury. It's to his non-throwing shoulder, so it would be his left shoulder. He throws right-handed, hits left-handed. We think this goes back to the McNeese State Series. There was a play early in game one against McNeese where he slid into second base and came up real awkwardly and – and we think that's where this stems from, that he's been playing through that for several weeks. Yeah, I, you know, it's crazy. Like, I don't know if it's a curse or not. I, I, I like to see those little things that happen. And you know your player's body language. I remember him sliding in, and he got up, and he was he was holding his arm, and he was doing this. And I, I want to say I said something to Phil. I said, boy, I hope he didn't hurt his arm. Mm -hmm. But you could see he was, he was trying to move it. And I've done that before. I've jammed my shoulder sliding in to a base, and it's, it's not good. I've tore a ligament sliding in head first. Mm -hmm. um, you just tell something's wrong. And I don't think he said anything to the staff. And I think he's just been trying to play through it. And I think it finally got to the point where, you know, he had to do something about it. And so nothing, nothing serious. It's just uh, – it's just part of playing baseball. You just get banged up. And, you know, when the more you try to play through it, you kind of make it worse sometimes. So he's going to be fine, though. They think he'll play against South Carolina this weekend. Not going to play today against Texas Tech. Said he's got some swelling. They've given him some anti-inflammatories. And uh, they, they think he'll be ready to practice Thursday night. All right, next question is from Dylan in Bentonville. <clears throat> is there a chance Jason Jones could crack the lineup for SEC play this weekend? I mean, I would not be surprised if you see him as a DH against a left-handed pitcher uh, or a pinch hitter against. The, he reminds me of a Loy in the fact that whenever he, whenever he gets ready to swing, he's going to give it his all. You mentioned the 111 mile an hour off the center field wall double. The eighth inning double that he had was 113 miles an hour off yeah. the bat. I mean, this guy <laughs> really smoked it. And it seems like when he's gotten his chances in the midweek here, the last couple of weeks, he's really performed pretty well. You know, he has, and okay, so we I brag on Peyton Hold all the time. He's another one that's got an unbelievable attitude. I love the kid. I love talking to him. He's always in a good mood. Now, it's easy to say, you know, you're playing baseball for University of Arkansas. How can you not be in a good mood? You know, but uh, he every day he goes out and he works. And I know, you know, him and, and, and Nate Thompson, they've been working a little bit on his swing. They've made a few tweaks here and there. And um, I think he really likes it, and I think you're starting to see the difference. Like in BP, I mean, he's always hit the ball hard, but, boy, he is hammering balls in BP. It's, it takes a little bit of time to get that BP swing into the game. So I tell you, he's special, man. When he hits it, 
there's a few guys on the team that have that special sound off their bat. He's one of them, mm. and I hope he gets a chance. I know he works hard. Uh, he works hard on his defense. He's gotten way better out in left field, but when he hits the ball, he hits it hard, and you know, he's definitely force in the lineup. So to answer the question, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him in there you know, against, uh, against a lefty on the weekend. Jason was such a big recruit out of high school down in North Texas that – it's easy to, to give up on a player like that. And I'm talking about not as a coach, but as, you know, maybe a, a just a casual observer, you know, and say, hey, you know, the, he just didn't live up to the rankings. But sometimes it takes a little while for those guys to act. It, it's like it takes different players different amounts of times to acclimate to new levels of, of sports, whatever it is, baseball, basketball, football. I mean, even Peyton Stovall, he didn't, you know, he, right. he wasn't playing up to the level that I think people thought he would. Chad Spanberger is one who I think about who oh, you know, yeah. the first two years is like, you know, what is this guy? And then the last year, boom, that, okay, that's what they were talking about. I think you might see that from Jones maybe, you know, toward the end of this year and and, and, and certainly next year. Well, Andrew Benatendi, remember his yeah. freshman year? Yeah, he, had the, he, he had the broken had. bone in his hand that, that affected him. But. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he struggled, you know, stayed home. That that neck that off season worked on his swing, but yeah, it takes guys a long time, especially guys that, you know, Jason Jones probably never struggled in his life. Yeah. Peyton Stova probably never yeah. struggled. Um, you come to this level, and it's baseball, such a mental game. You struggle a little bit; it can affect you a little bit, and then you start you start doubting your mechanics. You know, you start doubting yourself, and mm -hmm. then it can snowball from there. But I think I still say. You know, he's a guy that's going to be special. And, you know, I interviewed him early on, you know, post-game. And, and I said, look, when I, when I think of a major league outfielder, it's you. That's what I told him. I said, I said that's – you look like a big league outfielder to mm -hmm. me. Uh, he hits the ball like a big league outfielder. It's a matter of just taking all that into the game. And, you know, it's easier said than done sometimes. But I think he's really starting to make a, a, a step forward. His at bats are getting better, and that's that's what you want to see. It's all you know. It's it's all based on matchups, but like I feel like Souza is their left-handed DH. That 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 much yeah. is pretty clear. Uh, but their right-handed DH has kind of been something that they've been looking to figure out. Like who's this Wagner? You know, he'll come in, he'll have a good game. I thought he hit pretty well last night. Uh, but but Jones with the way he's hitting, I, it wouldn't surprise me if, if he was able to get in as a DH as, as their right-handed. Right. Yeah, Wagner. Like you said, Wagner's another one though. Just puts together professional bats. Here's the thing: we need, we need another team. We need, <laughs> there's so many guys. You're like back in the '60s, yeah. they had the shows, the foot, like the freshman football team. They need, yeah. Like these guys can go out and play on you know Mondays and Thursdays, <laughs> like a JV squad or something. I don't yeah. know. All right, Blake. All right, next one's from Army Hog. Do you have an update on Hunter Dietz? I do. Hunter Dietz. Uh, had an MRI and an X-ray last week. They're pleased, I guess, with the results of the, the of both of those tests. We don't know exactly where it is that he's hurting, and I don't want to speculate on that. We know that it's not the elbow, that it's not related to the elbow surgery that he had. At least that's what, what Dave Van Horn said last week when he left the game uh, early against San Jose State. Probably not going to pitch this week. May not pitch next week, but they're hoping that they've got him back and, and able to go again within a couple of weeks. You know, you, you take a guy like that, he's got so much upside, there's no need to rush him. You know, we've got enough depth right now. They they need to make sure he's right and then bring him back and he's going to be fine, whether it's, you know, in a, in a week or two or whenever. I mean, I don't think there's any need to rush a guy like that because he's, he's going to be a big part of this team down the road, whether it ends up materializing this year or next. At some point, he's going to be – he, he's a dude. He's going to be there. He's probably your Friday night starter – Within a year or two. Yeah, I think so. Likely. I mean, you, you picture, you just think, think of him and Geichel. Or yeah, I mean, Gackel. It's like it's like the new generation <laughs> of Hagen Smith and Brady Tiger. Yeah, Although right. I think that I think that Dietz and Gackel, at least what we saw in the off season, they may have been better when they came in yeah. uh, than than Smith and and Tiger were at least at that level or at yeah. least at that age. Blake. All right, last one is from podcast superstar you to man. He's, I think he's had a question on every episode this year. Uh, what is a normal day like for the players? What time do they get down to the field? What time do they leave, et cetera? And how do they get their classwork when they go on the road? Oh, how about that? So I know that they typically show up to the field about four hours before game time, and I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, they get there early. Um, they have their, their team meal. Then they go over the scouting report for that day. 
pitchers go do their things. The hitters go over the scouting report. And I'll tell you, since they moved it up, I used to sit in on the scouting report, Matt. And honestly, out of everything that I did, that was my favorite part of the day is mm. sitting in on the scouting report, watching the video of that day's pitcher and kind of the attack, how they their plan of attack against the guy. It was awesome. I loved it. It reminded me of back in the day, um, you know, with the Rockies or the Yankees sitting there watching, okay, this is, you know, this is Kerry Wood. This is this is what he throws. This is how he patterns. You watch how he pitches other guys. They spend some time doing that. Some guys will go from there and do, like, individual work. They kind of have an hour after that before stretch to kind of do a little bit of individual work. Um, if they want extra swings, whatever they need to do to get their mind right, then they take the field. You know, if it's like last night, a 7 o'clock game, they're out there at 4.30 stretching. Uh, BP at 4.45, or they take a few ground balls, do some some ground ball work. Um, BP starts at 4.45, they hit for an hour. They, they go back to the clubhouse, they come back out, take infield, and get ready to strap it on for a game. But, you know, there's so much that goes through it. You know, pitchers after the game, you know, like a, a reliever, like I was talking to a Dylan Carter after the game, you know, when everyone else is leaving, you know, Dylan's down there doing his band work and doing some, you know, just – just a little bit of simple, you know, body work, stuff like that to get the, you know, kind of work the kinks out, get the blood flow going in after throwing, stuff like that. And so it's a long day. People don't realize all the work that these guys put in. They, you know, these the fans show up at 7 and watch the game. But these <laughs> guys have been there, like you said, four or five hours before the game getting prepared for what the, the fans get to see on the field. And it's really it's really neat to see how much work they put in. And, look, just not not the players, the staff. I know guys like Zach Barr is unbelievable. Zach's, Zach's probably the first one there, probably the last one to leave. But that's why when you see a ball hit in a hole and we have a guy standing there, that's Zach Barr. That's his advanced scouting. So this, the the coach the coaching staff does a great job of getting there and putting in their time. So it's, a, it's awesome. All right, well, we appreciate your questions. Hope you'll uh, uh, continue to send those in as, as we go along throughout the year. Let's talk about the SEC race. Uh, Arkansas was in a good spot, and they're, and they're not in a bad spot right now. Kentucky is a team that mystifies me because I keep waiting on Kentucky to stump its toe, and it just doesn't happen. And not only are they not losing, but, I mean, they're beating up teams really bad, and, and they're 14-1 and one going into this weekend. Now, I – think that their schedule is backloaded. I think they play tougher teams the, the final five weeks collectively than they did the first five. And it starts this weekend. Now, it's on their home field, but they've got Tennessee coming in. You know, I'm like you. Every week I keep thinking, okay, this is the week that it's going to end. And they just keep going out. And they're not just winning. I mean, they're pounding people. I mean, and their pitching's been good. You know, sometimes they'll – you know, you'll see Kentucky get off to a hot start, and then they'll just kind of fizzle out. Well, I'm waiting for that fizzle to happen, and it's <laughs> it's not happening. And so, I guess they're really good. I mean, I've looked at their offensive numbers, and they're they're crazy. Mm -hmm. Their offensive numbers and their pitching's you know, their pitching's pretty good too. They're not they're, they're not mm -hmm. they're, you know they've got some guys that can that can throw under it, so. Ben They've always been a team that can hit. It, right. It's been the pitching that's kind of been their undoing. No, it has. And uh, this year, I want to say they're second behind us in runs allowed. Um, mm. I've got the stats somewhere. Uh, ERA, they're second. Uh, Razorbacks are first in SEC and uh, ERA, 296 ERA, and just SEC only. Kentucky's second with 327 uh, earned run average. So, I mean, they're they're right there in the top. And then, you know, hitting, we know they're they're up there. So, yeah. I don't know if they're going to fall apart or not. <laughs> so, so they're fourteen and one. A and M is in second place with a thirteen and two record. They were really impressive. I thought last week putting it on Vanderbilt three times down at Blue Bell. Yeah, they they, they are now. A and M's the the team. They're the ones that worries me. We 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 play there later in the year. I wish end of we, the season. I wish we had them here. I, mm. I would feel way better, but. I've got a chance to watch them play a few times, and they're they're good. They've got arms, they've got bats up and down the lineup. Mm -hmm. They're a big, strong, physical team. They got power arms. Um, they're the real deal. Interesting dynamic with them. You know, they're number one now in all the polls. Arkansas fell to number two. Uh, they go to Alabama this week, so Alabama's going to have back to back number one teams on their field where they play a, a, a pretty good brand of baseball. They're a totally different team on their home field than they are away from home. They're 0-6 away from home, but at home they beat beaten Arkansas and Tennessee and South Carolina. 
Yeah, I, I tell you, other than the – I mean, the Kentucky series is going to be fun, but I'm really watching that because I want to see how Alabama does against A&M in their home ballpark because, mm-hmm. well, you know, you look, Alabama got beat last night by – I mean, someone beat them five to two. I don't even know who they got beat by, but it was UAB, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was UAB. And how do they only score two runs? <laughs> the offense that we saw over the weekend, how do they only score two runs? I mean, maybe they played some. Maybe they played some <clears throat> non-starters. I, I don't know, but I was really impressed with Alabama's offense. I thought top to bottom, they put together good at bats. <clears throat> um, so we'll see. We'll see how they do against uh, A&M's pitching. I think that's going to be a fun – that'll be a fun series to we'll keep up with. I gave A&M's SEC record wrong. They're 11-4. and four. Arkansas is 12-3, so Arkansas actually got a one-game lead on them in the division. A&M's got a better overall record than Arkansas. After that, it really falls off in the West. Yeah. Mississippi State 7-8, and eight, Alabama 6-9, and nine, Ole Miss is 5-10, and 10, LSU 3-12. and 12. Auburn, who I think is a good team, they just keep playing top 10 teams week after week after week. They're 2-13. and 13. Right now in the SEC, kind of a similar thing in the East. You got Kentucky at fourteen and one, Tennessee at ten and five, and there's a little bit of a drop off. Vanderbilt and South Carolina both tied at eight and seven. Arkansas goes to South Carolina this week. Did you see the Mike Bianco video uh, yes. the other night against yeah. Mississippi State? Okay. That was. I wanted them to keep the mic open. I wanted open mic, and I, I mean, I wanted to hear that argument between he and Scott Klein. You heard part of it. <laughs> so was that Carl Rabbits on the call? That was uh, Tom Hart and Kyle Peterson. Oh, and Kyle's in town here for this game, and then Rabbits is, is in town here for Arkansas. Okay. Well, Attack. I got a chance to, to talk to Kyle for a second last night, but um, I wanted to bring that up to him because it was so funny how they, they played that off. They're like, uh, because the hot mic caught what Mike Bianco was really thinking. Oh, yeah. And they were like, oh, yeah, you can clearly see that Mike Bianco or hear that Mike Bianco's uh, vis- visibly uh, upset about that. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the, the words yeah. that came across the mic. <laughs> yeah, you can hear it. He said, that bat landed at my feet, and then it got <laughs> it got real good. I think that would make a baseball broadcast better. I didn't get you got your FCC and all this yeah. nonsense, but it would make, make a broadcast really fun if you could have – Mike's on the field, and you could hear what's being said at all times. It, I, I think it'd be awesome. I'd love it. Uh, even if you've got to just beep it out. Yeah. You know, like my son will watch some stuff on YouTube. It'll be like the, you know, the best ejections of managers, and it, it'll beep out. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, do something like that. Of course, you know what they're saying. But, um, yeah, I don't know what you thought about the call. I mean, the way I understand the rule, he should have been tossed. This is the same player from Mississippi State, the catcher who was kneeing the Georgia runner yeah. that led to that whole fiasco down in Starkville a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the, the rule is that if you throw the bat at the opposing dugout, it's supposed to be an automatic ejection. So I yeah. think Bianco was, was within his right there. Well, I think so. I mean, and look, it's I get it. It's, it's the 12th inning. It's a home run. It's your first home run of the year in the 12th inning. But have a little bit of etiquette. There's Matt, and look, I'm not, I'm not old fuddy duddy. <laughs> let's have fun. Let's celebrate home runs. Let's, but let's do it to your towards your dugout. Don't yeah. toss the bat. To That's the, the whole rule. Teams. You throw the you throw the bat at your dugout. You're fine. You throw yeah. it at the opposing dugout. You're it's supposed to be an ejection. I mean, I, I think he should have been tossed. I think it was a horrible call. And and it, you know, and it I pissed still all this off. Yeah, they yeah, came no. back and won at the bottom of the inning, and then they beat them fourteen to two in Game Three. Exactly. Don't poke the bear, right? Don't give the other team like I hate a guy that strikes out and then like struts towards the batter, looking at him. You know, you just don't do that because yeah. I, I've been in the opposing dugout. Actually, I've been the guy that struck out and had the pitcher stare me down on the way back to the dugout. You know what? He didn't strike me out next time. I got him next mm. time. It's that mental edge. It's that little bit of mental – I can go back, Err. and it radiates throughout the dugout. When you get a guy acting a fool on the mound, you're going to get him when you're in that other dugout. And it, it works both ways. And as far as the tag goes, I never understood that tag that that catcher made. I mean, that was – I don't know what he was doing. and you know, There had to be something. There had to be some sort of beef between them before that play. Yeah, because that That's was – That's all I can – because did that or – he just lost his mind. Yeah, I mean, dude, dude, psycho, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was. It, it was. I've never seen anything like that. No, that was. That Look was at crazy. us talking about the SEC again. We said we were going to do this this year. I, I mean, you know, you almost have to though. <laughs> I mean, there's so much stuff. Yeah. Look, the SEC is awesome. I love it. I, I I get so entertained. 
Um, I hate the SEC website, but I still I like it's going horrible. on I'm there. I'm actually sitting here yeah. right now trying to navigate <laughs> between standings and schedule. Hey, I love Phil Elson, and it's so he gets so frustrated during games. He actually found a new website. Someone tweeted him last night about a different website, but he's trying to find the scores, and he's awesome at calling a game and like finding the scores and like I can ask him some random question. He'll find me the answer. I don't know how he does it. Um, but he gets so frustrated with the SEC oh. website. And, you know, I try to navigate it. Like this morning, I'm trying to go through to, to jot down a few things, and mm-hmm. it, you just can't find anything on there. I mean, I don't know why they changed it. Yeah, I, that's, right, that's, I don't know. That's my rant for All the right. day. I'm good now. <laughs> I guess it's the four hours of sleep, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah we're, t- we're tired, by the way. we still got a baseball game to go here in a little bit. Um, the rotation. We talked about Hagen, and, and, and I touched on this a little bit earlier. Hagen is so dominant that it can make good outings by Molina and Tiger the next two days look just kind of pedestrian, right? I mean, right. you know, Hagen not really allowing base runners, a whip under one. Uh, and then, you know, Molina and Tiger, they're not that type of pitcher. They're, they're going to work with base runners. Tiger was in the stretch almost the entire time, it felt like, in, in Tuscaloosa. Molina dealt with base runners too. But the bottom line is not to allow runs. And those two have been really effective at, at, at that, you know, for the most part. Right. You know, I mean, you take a you take an outing away here and there, but for the most part, they've been really effective at that. And, and I thought they were really good at that against Alabama. Tigert especially uh, did a great job of, of pitching around base runners. Well, and you, you look at the beginning of the game, he had a hard time landing his breaking ball, so he was able to get him out with a fastball changeup. And that's when you know you're special. You don't. You know, I think his breaking ball is the best pitch. He's got two different ones. He's got more of the traditional break ball. He's got the sweeper. But look at – think about our starting pitching. 17 innings, three runs versus Alabama. On their so, field. On their field. Yep. So if you told me that at the end of a series, I'd be like, all right, we won the series. We might have swept. Mm-hmm. In, in my mind, if you look at the, just what you're starting – because your starting pitching is the key. It all starts there. I would have thought we'd have swept or at least won two out of three because that's incredible what those guys are doing. Mm-hmm. And you're right, Hagen. You know, even Hagen got knocked because he only he only struck out six. I'm sorry if you're if you're an SEC pitcher, <laughs> a Friday night guy, and you're striking out one per inning. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah. He w- he took a no hitter into the sixth. Did he not? Uh, he did. Yeah. I mean, he only gave up two hits, no runs. I mean, who cares? I, I, are we falling in love with the strikeout too a much? Bit, a little bit. I mean, he's not going to strike out 15 I think every game. It's, it's the chase. It's it's trying to catch Nick Schmidt. I think that's on a lot of people's mind. You know, he, 345 is the career strikeout record for Schmidt. I think Hagen's somewhere in the 280 range, 290 range right now. I think there's a lot of people who's like, hey, you know, he's got to stay on this 9, 10 per game pace to, to be able to catch that. A lot of people want to see him break that record this year, and he may do it. But who, who cares? Do you really <laughs> care about that? I, I want to win – I want to win the College World Series. I think it's one of uh, baseball's one of those sports. It's like you want to win the games, but then you want to like achieve all these little, you know, milestones throughout. It's like kind of like playing Mario Brothers, you know. Like yeah. you want to get to level eight, but you know, you want to <laughs> uh, it's been a long time since okay. I played the NES, but <laughs> <laughs> Okay. No here's sleep. What, here's what uh, this you know the streaks that I like. What's that? I like the winning streak at Baum Walker. Twenty four games. Twenty four games. I, I think that's I think that's awesome, and I think the reason I think it's awesome is because I talk about our fans all the time. Look at us last night, a Tuesday night game, and it's what eleven o'clock, and yeah. that place is still packed, mm-hmm. going crazy. And look, I think that attributed to the pitcher's meltdown on the mound. That dude was good on the mound. He's what a, oh, like a zero point, four, oh, four 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 yeah. yeah, earned run average. But I think. The moment got up to it. I think the, I think the crowd attributed to hmm. that. I mean, I really do. You know, he hit McLaughlin with a one-two pitch, wasn't even close. Got the fans yelling at him. He gets the ground ball. He kind of panics, bobbles it. You know, I, he slips. He pees down his leg. He throws the ball. In the, I mean, there's everything that could go wrong in that play went went wrong. But I think the fans were awesome. So streaks like that, I like. I don't know, uh, hunting a strikeout or a home run record, stuff like that. I. As much as I love home runs, I don't even I don't even know who the career home run leader is for Arkansas. I don't care. Um, I don't care who the strikeout leader is. I guess you know maybe. And I bet if you ask Hagen Smith, you think he cares? Not if he wins a ring. Yeah, I exactly. mean I think that's I think that's what he's looking for. Yeah. So Arkansas goes to South Carolina this week. South Carolina has been really good. Another top twenty five team uh, that the Razorbacks are going to play. 
Uh, they just beat Florida, and it seems like everybody's beating Florida right now. That's a team that's really hard to figure out. They come into Bomb next week, and I think they're like 19 and 16, 19 and 17 after last night. It's a it, it's very strange to figure out Florida right now. Uh, hard to do, but South Carolina beat them twice last weekend. I believe that game or that series was in Columbia. Got pretty good pitching this year. The thing that stands out to me about South Carolina is that there may not be a better three headed hitting monster in the SEC than. Ethan Petrie, Gavin Cassis, and Cole Messina, uh, those guys are really, really good. No, they are. And I tell you, I went back and looked at what we did with Petrie last year. Uh, you realize he was one for 11. I knew he struggled. Oh, Arkansas shut South game. Carolina yeah. down all three yeah. games. because yeah, Hagen pitched well in, in game one. Game two, they lose three to one. But that's the one where Tigert and Will McIntyre go nine. And then uh, the last one is on Mother's Day where Hunter Holland throws this great game with yeah. his mom, you know, and, and everything that happened with her. Yeah, they shut them down for three games last year. Yeah, I mean, he's one for 11 with seven Ks. Really didn't do anything. Um, but you're right. I mean, those are three good hitters in, in the lineup. Uh, you look at their numbers, though, and it's it's really hard to, you know, you can look at South Carolina and SEC, SEC only. So when we get to the, about the midpoint of the year, I don't know how you, you analyze stats. Once we get to about midseason – in the SEC, I start looking at SEC stats. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they do against the other chumps. I want to know what they're doing against SEC and SEC. You know, they're they're hitting they're they're ninth with a two fifty seven um, uh, batting average. Um, you know, they've scored ninety six runs. They're averaging six point four runs a game. Razorbacks are averaging you know five and a half runs a game. I mean, you can you know, but where we really stand out is our pitching. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know we've we're we've only allowed forty seven runs. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Um, you know, they've allowed ninety five. They're eighth. You know, six point three runs per game is what they're allowing. Those are kind of the things that that I start to look at. And you know, I guess you can't really do it t totally because. Teams are different at home and on the road. Mm -hmm. South Carolina is another team that's good at home and not as good on the mm -hmm. road. So, you know, all that I just told you was probably I just wasted two minutes of your <laughs> your time. <laughs> and, and, you know, like with Arkansas, I think the verdict is out on are they a good road team this year? They're 3-3 three and three in road yeah. games. You know, Auburn, like we said, could have gone either way. Alabama could have gone either way. And, you know, probably 3-3 three and three probably is about the right record for the way that they played on the road yeah. this year. Uh, South Carolina's got some older pitching right-hander. Now, they haven't announced their rotation for the weekend, but if they keep the same rotation they've had, it'll be right-hander Eli Jones on Friday, right-hander Ty Good on Saturday, and left-hander Matthew Becker on Sunday. All of these guys are sub-4 ERAs. Uh, good has been really good for them, uh, ERA under 2, at least going into the, the Florida game last week. Um, they can pitch, and, and it could it could be a, a deal kind of like last year where you got three low scoring games. I think so. I, I, you look at Ty Good's got the best numbers. He's senior, uh, two hundred four in the SEC. You know he's a, they're only uh, opposing batters are hitting one ninety four against them, one ninety four in the SEC. So he's. Yeah, but you're right. No, no. no Matthew Becker struggled just a little bit. Uh, their Sunday guy's a lefty. Um, his numbers in the SEC aren't that good. Hitters are hitting two ninety five against him, but. Mm -hmm. You know, you you look at Zane Adams. <laughs> I hate to contaminate the you know, the conversation. Can I but... say something about Zane Adams real quick? I looked up something on him. He was like the number two hundred five draft prospect last year by Baseball America, and that's overall. And so, if you're talking about just freshmen, you're probably talking about top seventy five, ninety range. Yeah. Among or at least uh, or players out of high school last year, high school seniors. So it's not like this guy just kind of came out of nowhere. It's that he's, I think it's probably that he's starting to pitch up to the level that they thought he would when they recruited him out of the Houston area. Yeah, you know what? I didn't think about that, but you're, you're probably right. It's uh, by this point in the year, these guys aren't freshmen anymore. Mm -hmm. They've been through fall ball, they're halfway through the SEC. They're, I don't look at them as freshmen. I, I want to say DVH said something about Souza last night. 60, 70 at bats right now. He's really not a freshman anymore, he's just a good hitter. Mm hmm. What's the key to this weekend? Um, I think we have to hit better. I think we do. I, I really do. I think we have to put together better at bats um, than we did against uh, Alabama. I think we're. I think our defense will be there. I think we made a, mi a few miscues, um, but I, I think it comes down I, our pitching. We 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 know what our pitching is going to give us. I mean, we're, we're we're we've got a pretty good feel going in what we're going to get out of our pitching staff. I think they'll shut these – I don't want to say shut these guys down, but I think they'll control – you know, they're not going to let a Petrie hurt them. 
Mm. If it comes in a situation, there, that he's not going to be the guy that hurt us. And someone else might. But I, I think it comes down to us just scoring a few more runs. You know, Phil Phil's amazing. You know, and I'm always bragging on Phil. I love Phil. Uh, he in his he put the magic number for us scoring. You know, I always talk about money ball all the time. How much? How many runs do we have to score to win? Mm-hmm. Phil kind of puts ours at four. If we score four runs, we're gonna we're gonna win the game because we're just because of our pitching staff. Now the formula is how do we score four runs? And I I, I look at. I look at their staff. Their starters are okay, but you know, you get in that bullpen. They, I don't, I don't see anyone in that bullpen that's really dominant. That scares me. But you know, the key is getting those starters out of the out of the game, running up their pitch count, being selective, kind of like we did against Hess on mm-hmm. Friday night. I thought our approach against Hess was great. You know, we almost got him out of there in what third inning. You know, but I think that's the key early on is to get that starter out. Get the pitch counts up, get into their bullpen early, and I think the rest of the weekend will just kind of fall into place. Kind of interesting. The next two weeks, you know, Caglione at Florida is who a lot of people think is going to go one-one this year in the draft. A lot of people think Petri may go one-one in twenty twenty-five. Either he or Jace Lavalette at uh, Texas A and M. Those are kind of the top two, at least college draft prospects right now. So kind of interesting. Yeah. You might see back-to-back weekends where you you play the first round. Or the first overall pick in the major league draft in, in in two years. That's a that doesn't happen very often. Right. And Caglione, you know what? I'm looking forward to seeing Caglione. By the way, oh, the, uh, can you imagine the buzz in the stadium when Hagen Smith goes out against Jack Caglione in the first oh, inning of that gonna, Friday game? That's gonna be fun. I want to say he hit one over 500 feet last night, didn't he? <laughs> I was talking to somebody earlier. They said 500 yards, but yeah, I think it was like 500 feet. 500 yards, 500 <laughs> feet. Who cares? It went a long way. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, he can he can he can certainly mash the baseball. All right, Arkansas and South Carolina this weekend. It's going to be in Columbia. Also, Arkansas, Texas Tech uh, this afternoon. If you're watching us live or you hear this before the four o'clock first pitch, uh, that game is going to be on SEC Network this afternoon. Uh, Arkansas and South Carolina three times: Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Hope you come to WholeHogSports.com to read all of our coverage. Uh, from Texas Tech, from South Carolina, or you can go to uh, the. You can listen to Bubba. I almost called you Phil. Uh, th- that would have been so offensive to you. Uh, almost okay, so you. <laughs> what last time Brett Dolan called me Phil? Yeah, is it's the last time we lost at Baum Walker. Just saying. So I hey, hope are you, you going to North Little Rock next week? I don't know yet. Probably not. Okay, they play. Nor- it's, it's hard. It's hard to get away. Yeah, I, that's, I, a, that's I got, a tough yeah. one. They play so, North Little Rock Tuesday night of next week. So a lot of stuff to discuss next week on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. But you can listen to Bubba on Razorback Sports Network. We appreciate you joining us, and we hope to see you next week. Go Hogs. Thanks to Kendall King, where their design talents are showcased by teamwork. Kendall King, Shop Cart, and Soapbox. They're your design professionals with home run stats.